So I, I think we've sufficiently made the point that at number two, that prayer changes what would otherwise have occurred had we not prayed. Uh, and that God is telling us in his word that he wants us to pray and to be in a dynamic relationship with him. That's really what this is all about. That's what the whole creation is about is to enter into fellowship with the creator so that we can live with him forever. And he wants that relationship. And our choices to pray or not to pray, are they're not going to thwart his accomplishing his predestined plan because he already knows what you will. Now that he's created this world, he knows what you will do, but it's still up to you to do it or not. But he wants you to do it. And he wants you to be a very important part. We're going to tie that in, uh, that thought again at the end of class about this is the way God created us as man to have dominion and to make a difference in the world. But now let's talk about this other thing we mentioned where uh, I think Veronica mentioned that, well, sometimes our prayer doesn't change what is what was going to occur because God has the right to say, I'm not going to grant that prayer. And that's his prerogative. He's sovereign. But that leads us to the next thing. Prayer changes your character. And this is what a dynamic relationship with God does, uh, which is what's uh, at the heart of it is prayer. And so here uh, at number three, I say prayer changes your character. And now this is changes the direction of the man. And you can see how I'm making this in distinction to what I said at number two, where it changes the direction of the world. Well, this changes the direction of the man. And where I said changes the direction of the world according to God's will, this changes the direction of the man according to your will. So this is the divine dynamic when you're in a relationship with God between his will and your will. And it has to do with you taking your will to him. Right? And you make choices when you pray. Primarily, you make choices on what you put your mind to, what you set your mind on, what you think about, what you meditate on. I have here under the number or letter A says prayer involves meditation on the things of God. This is at the heart of prayer. You are coming before your creator, the holy God of heaven, and you have that privilege. And that is an active relationship going on at that moment. But again, this is according to your free will. You choose what you're going to pray about. You choose what you're going to think about. You choose all of these things. And that's what God is going to use to mold your character. And this is going to go according to your Will. And here's what I mean by that as we get into some of these details. So letter B says, you determine what things to fill your mind with in your prayers. And these can greatly influence your feelings, your attitudes, <coughs> your decisions. And ultimately, this will shape your character. Now, I have uh, some a, a couple of... Uh, video clips that I want to show. Uh, J.P. Moreland is a, uh, well, he's a theologian, philosopher, but he's also a scientist, uh, a physicist, or was it a chem chemist? I can't remember. I have several of his books. Um, this was one he wrote on the soul. Uh, this was his more accessible one, the only one I can read. I can't read his, his other scholarly stuff. It's, it's uh, too philosophical. But this is one called Finding Quiet. Uh, he contracted cancer, or however you say that. He got cancer and went into a deep you know, disorientation, uh, into uh, depression and anxiety and such. But he's an expert, one of the leading Christian philosopher experts on the soul. And uh, he wrote this on how to, it's called Finding Quiet, My Story of Overcoming Anxiety and the Practices that Brought Peace. And I have a couple of quotes from him on your outline, but instead of just reading those quotes, I think that at least some of the things he says will help us in springboard into some of our discussion about what I mean when I say, letter B, 
You determine what things fill your mind with, you fill your mind with, which can greatly influence your feelings, your emotions, your whole character. Um, and so here is where he talks about specifically about prayer. Let's see if the volume turned up should be there's some, there's some gems with that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what is very interesting to me, uh, Brian, is, the co is that uh, psychology and neuroscience are discovering that the things the scriptures taught are true. For example, I'll give you an example. The most important thing a person can do, even more than having hope in life and, and having a positive attitude, is the daily practice of expressing gratitude. Believe it or not, studies have shown that that is, for mental health, that trumps almost everything else. Mm. Well, I mean, in a biblical view of the world, well, guess what? Part of, part of what we're here to do is to express gratitude. Now, if you're an atheist, there's, there, there, you know, I can express gratitude to you for getting <coughs> coffee or whatever, but you can't have gratitude for a sunset over Maui. You can like it, you can be happy about it, but you can't express gratitude for it because there's nobody to be grateful to. Mm. We were made to function best when we're expressing gratitude. Well, isn't that odd? So I think that fits into it. That's a psychological discovery. It's part of what's called positive psychology. And it's and it's they've also discovered that your neurons and your brain connections are chain your brain structures change it's called neuroplasticity by doing gratitude. And so your brain and your self your psyche were actually made to do that. So I mean, but the scriptures say you know express gratitude all the time. You know, well, gee, guess what? It actually works. But grace to you and thanks be to God. Well, it's kind of built in, I guess. Well, right? that ain't bad. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have some birds out there, don't we? That's we do. Awesome. Oh, they're just coming to sing a song there. Uh, last couple questions here. Uh, how long have you been married, JP? I've been married since 1977. Let, let's stop there for a second. So, did anything resonate with you in particular? Nah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we are tying this in to our discussion in this class about God's providence, that is, His providing for us, His gracing us. And one of those ways that God graces us is through our prayers. Okay? And He's given us very specific truth that's related to that. He called it neuroplasticity. That is to say, it shapes, it changes the way our brains are shaped. It changes the way we think. It changes the way, it changes our habits, right? Uh, and, and that's, you know, I guess I have a couple of those quotes there from it. But like at the bottom, it says, they've, this, they've discovered that your neurons and your brain connections are changed. This is called neuroplasticity by expressing gratitude. So, you know, be thankful in all things. In all things, give thanks to God through Jesus Christ your Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the Bible says this over and over and over. And this is part of what I mean when I say prayer changes you. Even if it doesn't change what God is doing in some specific way that you just prayed for. But it is changing you. And when it changes you, it changes the world. Because of your service in the world. Right? So these are ways that this... Divine sovereignty and human freedom can work together in a very practical way, right? That, that God wants us to pray. He wants us to be persistent in prayer. The persistent widow of Luke 18 asked the judge, begged the judge for, for justice, and he didn't care anything about justice, and she went day after day and just continued to wear on him, remember? But that was just as important for her character shape, right? For her character formation as it was for finally getting the judge to do something legally about it in the real world or out in the world, right? And so that's, that's the point we're trying to make here about our prayer and God's providence. Um, uh, this, this applies to so many things like we, lately in the last 20 years or so, it's been a big problem with uh, the pornography epidemic. 
that destroys young men's minds, or all men's minds for that matter, or men and women, I guess. I always just study on the men part of it, but men are especially prone to that kind of thing because they're visual. But it take, you know, you can get enslaved, can't you? You can get where he was talking about these channels in the brain that, that, are, that are so deep. It's like if you've seen erosion on a hillside when it rains and the, the rain cuts little caverns, you know, in, in the side of the hill and they can get really deep, right? And his point is, is that that's what happens in your brain when you become addicted to things like this and it becomes compulsive. And the Bible says, and Jesus calls this being a slave to sin. You're caught in it, and it's now compulsive, and you, you need help. You can't just decide your way out of it because you are trapped because of this very thing. And so you need accountability. You may need professional counseling. You need a plan. You may even need to go into a place where they take freedoms away from you where you can't get on the Internet for a period of time until you can get go through the... I mean, that sound, I know that sounds like... I mean, it isn't just like alcohol addiction, right? Or, or any other kind of drug addiction. And so the point is, is that as faithful Christians, if we focus on a prayer life and focus on God's truth in our prayers, we go a long ways to safeguard ourselves against those things. Doesn't mean the temptation's not going to be there anymore because it will. But that means that you will be equipped, right? Because you will have continued to channel new uh, ditches, kind of, so to speak, in your neuroplasticity. And so this is the kind of thing that, that he's talking about, and uh, it, it applies to things like anxiety. So I'm going to play a, a part where he talks about something he mentioned in this book. Yes? I would just like to say a personal experience I had when I was bipolar. Um, I used to take, have to take a lot of medication and everything, and I went to see someone, and she did a procedure on me, which they usually do for... So can't pay attention. ADHD. ADHD. Where they put something on your head, attach little things to you, to your skull, hmm. and you watch a TV, you watch a movie, and as your brain is misfiring, the picture disappears. And so you have to retrain your brain to bring the picture back. So they have and, some sophisticated I treatments, did, I guess. I went through all yeah. of those treatments. You called it boot camp. Mm -hmm. But after I was through with all of them, I got to reduce my medication. Right. Significantly. Yeah. So I would imagine that's things, always the goal is try to get right, you off of any right. kind. So things in your brain, training your brain, and I could see how it would affect gratitude. Yes. That that would, your frontal lobe, which would, uh, you know, uh, pleasure. Yeah. Because it's pleasing to be, to be gracious and have gratitude. Right. So I could see I think there is a, there's would. also a, a, a circularity to that that says, you know, it will increase your ability to be grateful and being grateful will increase your ability to have the propensity to be grateful. And it right. becomes where you're, and here's the, the biblical terminology, you're no longer a slave of sin, you're a slave of Christ. See, see the point? That's what we want to get to, to be enslaved to righteousness. Uh, it sounds bad to use the word slavery, but that's the way the Bible uses it. And it has to do with shaping your mind to be conformed to Christ. Let me just play this. It's like two minute long clip and then we will get through the rest of our notes before it times up. But I just thought it was, it's helpful because he's touching on these very points about, and again, tying it back into our point here. You have the choice on what you think about. You have a choice about what you choose to meditate on and fill your mind with. Paul talks about this a lot in Philippians 4, doesn't he? Whatever things are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and noble of good report. Meditate on these things and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and thoughts through Christ Jesus. It's almost like a psychology book, book right there. But Paul is saying this is what Christ teaches us. So here's, here's his talk about anxiety. And it's just a couple of minutes here. Uh, thir one, thirteen, twenty. So I would say it's right. Fruitful for you as far as calming anxiety and really finding peace in your life? The number one thing I want to say to people about anxiety is that it is largely a learned habit. It's not entirely a learned habit. You can have very brain chemistry problems and so on. But it's largely something that you learn. You 
you learn to worry, you learn to practice very negative self-talk. You learn to say, well, gosh, what if this happens? And catastrophize, oh, I've got to make sure that doesn't happen. You, so we learn these things. The good news is that by forming new habits, you can unlearn them and replace them with being half full instead of half empty. Uh, not living in the future. I, I, you're not going to believe this, but I mean, my wife will tell you, she asks me, what do you got going next week? And I tell her, I have no idea. And it's been about five years since I made this turn, but I live in the present now. I do not live in the future. I spent my whole life living in the future, uh, worrying about what would happen. I really did. I spent 65 years or so. But I don't anymore because I formed the habit of learning how to turn away from that when I started going there. So eventually I replaced the grooves with new grooves that triggered new habits. And that I've got how to do that in the book. But so I would say to people, practicing certain things like expressing gratitude at various times during the day, and there are three or four others I mentioned, if you'll work at forming new habits, you're going to be lousy at it the first two or three months, like learning tennis or learning another language or whatever. So it's not going to work, it won't help you, and you'll think, I'm not making any progress. Well, that's just the way it is learning anything. You'll stick with it and do and practice these practices uh, for it'll be anywhere from two months to about four months, and you will now you will form a new habit. And then it will be no effort for you any longer. It'll be part of your very nature. You'll, you'll trigger not going to the future and worrying uh, because that's built into your muscle memory and your brain memory and all that. So that was that would be what I would say is to begin to, to realize that you can change this but not on the spur of the moment. What you have to do is begin to adopt such certain practices that are helpful in this area and I list them there and that's why people have been benefited. But be patient, because in the early stages of learning these new habits, you're going to be really bad at it. Then hang in there, and you'll eventually change. So you can see why the Bible says be persistent in your prayers. Pray evermore. Rejoice in all things, right? Um, you know, pray without ceasing. <laughs> it, 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 this is, you know, he's just bringing out specific areas where these truths hold you know, and can be can be experienced, uh, but sometimes it, it it's not natural for us sometimes to be grateful for things that we have. I mean, we live in a whole whole culture. Where sometimes we point out the entitlement mentality, right? Like like the world owes the young generation everything that they're getting, right? And and that's just totally destructive to their thinking, to their attitudes, and. And then it's, it can turn into this downward spiral to where you become enslaved in that and you're just completely unhappy. Your life is destructive. There's no pro productivity and you're not in fellowship with God. And it's just, it's tragic. So uh, that, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. But this is part of God's providence. God's providing these things for us. And he has ordered the world in such a way that this is how we grow in this way. And I wanted to focus here on, uh, well, Luke uh, 6, verse 27 is part of this, uh, something that we read in the Sermon on the Mount. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Now think about, of course, what Jesus is saying here. You will have people that are very distasteful to you. Maybe they want to harm you. Maybe they want to destroy you. Or maybe they just make your life miserable. Or you just don't like these people. And maybe you're even in a position to do them harm. But what is Jesus telling you to do here? He says, love them. Desire their best is the idea there. Do good to those who hate you. Bless them if they curse you and pray for them if they spitefully use you. So on your, on your notes, I have it number uh, page 9 on the back. says, uh, here's an example of what I mean by prayer changing you because you have a choice on what you think about and what you meditate on. So here's just something that came to mind as I was making these notes. And a thousand other things could be put in here. 
But this is what Jesus is saying. Focus on an enemy. When you're praying for your enemy, perhaps you realize and you remember he has a a three-year-old daughter. Or a daughter that's the same age as your daughter. And now, that's going to change your attitude. Because you're like, if I move to harm or destroy this man, how's that going to affect this man's daughter? I don't want to do that. I don't want to be somebody to destroy people's lives. I want to be somebody to build people's lives up. I'll entrust my problems with the Lord. And I will pray for this enemy. So when you're praying, you're thinking about these kinds of things. I mean, this is a possibility of what you're thinking about. He's got children. He's got a wife. Or he's just all of these things. And so I say here, pray, when you focus on an enemy and his children in prayer, that can shape your spiritual attitude toward our enemies. And it can move you to seek their well-being rather than their harm. I may be tempted to lash out against the person who offended me. But I can determine to meditate perhaps on his good qualities. So a brother in Christ does something that is, is ill-advised. I was going to say does something stupid. <laughs> But it always, you know, you, you tend to think that way, right? But you want to stop and think, okay, I, I have my own struggles too. I, I make dumb mistakes. And, you know, how, what can I do to help this person? And you can determine to think about those kinds of things. Meditate on his good qualities. In prayer, you can solidify those truths in your soul. And that's what will change you in such a way that you can have a positive attitude toward this person instead of having an emotional reaction where you're angry and you want revenge. And this is one way we can be guided by this biblical maxim. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So I, 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 I hope, and I don't know that I'm getting the point across as well as I, I wanted to or But do you see how this all ties into everything we've been talking about? God's providence. But it's based upon your obedience. It's based upon you making the free choice to grow in your prayer life. Based on your free choice to say, I'm going to tell somebody thank you today. And I'm going to mean it. And I'm going to have some reason why I'm telling them thank you. Because it... It edifies them, and it turns you into more like Christ. You just, it, it's up to you. God already knows what you're going to do, <laughs> but you determine what he knows you're going to do by what you actually do. And so it is an amazing truth. So we will go into letter C here. And basically, a lot of this is kind of review of what we just talked about. But uh, you'll see that uh, it kind of ties it all together here. So God's providence. Number one, although God already knows what we will freely choose, including our prayers, it's crucial to keep in mind that we are still free to make the choice. Number two, our free choice in the present determines what God foreknows in the past. And not vice versa, I say, because that's the Calvinists would say God foreknows what's going in the future because he determines it. Not because you do. So it's actually the opposite. You determine it, and that determines what God foreknows. Number three, God always desires that you choose His revealed will. But He will permit us, permit you to make the choice. Our character is changed by the choices we make, both in thought and action. So I... I want us to meet, remember that, that we're talk, when we talk about choices we make, not just the things we do, but the things we meditate on, our minds. And in turn, letter B, our propensity to make those choices in the future, in thought and action, will be greatly influenced by the character that's being shaped when we make those choices in the difficult times. I have a book called Salvation and Sovereignty that approaches it from this perspective and makes the point that There are what he calls will-setting moments in your life. 
I think I've heard it in other books called significant learning opportunities. Uh, but in other words, sometimes some choices are much, have much more gravity to them in your life at certain times than others. And it may be a time when you are tempted to pull out your phone and look at pornography. And you can think, okay, this is a significant temptation. And I can buckle down and I hope that I'm not enslaved to where I can make the choice here. I pray that I can make the choice to resist this temptation, get my mind on something else and do something productive. Now that could be one of these will-setting moments that is significant that makes your character such that the next time it comes, it's not nearly as difficult to do. Are you with me? And so that's what I mean by this, that your character has changed, but also that change in character makes the next choice more natural. Number four, further, since we have this kind of freedom as those that are given a measure of dominion over the creation, it is through our choices that we function as co-actualizers of the world in which we live. Now, here's what I mean by that. You know, I know that we say God is the creator, and he is. But what we're learning here, and especially from what he says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, is that he has decreed which history, remember we said we could think of these as histories, which history to create. So he knew what garden, where to put it, where to put the tree, and which persons, the ones we know of as Adam and Eve, but the persons, the souls that are there, he knew which ones to put there. He knew what they would do, and he knew what their children, and, and on and on and on down to today. And so God knew this, but you see how the world is in the process of being actualized. Are you with me? In other words, we make impacts in the direction of the world and the creation of the future. But God made us to do that. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? So you have that, and as a person given this privilege, you are a co-actualizer of the very world that God chose to create. Psalm 8, 3 through 6, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor and given him to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, everything that passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. I mean, these are truths that are brought up saying we have a unique role in the created order of dominion. And God gave us that privilege. And so our prayer life, and the things that flow from that make significant impacts in the future. And I say here, little letter A, because God has granted us this grace of freedom, we can be obedient agents in the accomplishing of his purposes. To reflect the glory of Jesus in our lives, to influence others to obey the gospel, to encourage our brothers and sisters to greater godliness, and on and on the list goes. Now, what role do you play in that? Because... You know, as a member of the church, you're part of the body. And we, oh, we all need one another, don't we? And so as a conclusion, I say here in Acts 17, verse 26 and 27, God determined when and where each one of us were born so that we can make the choice to seek and serve Him. And I often bring this out to the young people who... You know, look out into the world and see the mess that's going on and what are they going to do in the future and what about their children? I mean, that's a, those are serious questions to ask, right? You going to send your children to grade school? Up in the New England states or something, you know? No? Well, what are we going to do? I don't know, but I do know one thing. That God didn't put you here on accident. He knew exactly when you would be born and He knew He wanted to put you here in this particular culture at this particular time. And you can trust Him. Now just trust Him by obeying Him and applying yourself to knowing Him better and serving Him. That's what Paul says there. He says, uh, you know, he, from one blood He's made every nation of men to dwell in all the face of the earth and He has pre-appointed the boundaries of their dwelling and the times of their habitation that they should seek the Lord and grope for Him and find Him because He's not far from any one of us. In Him we live and move and have our very being. All right. And then the final sentence there says, regardless of our choices, God's purposes will indeed be accomplished 
And we will indeed be responsible for the choices that we make. And so be faithful. God's predetermined plan will come to fruition, but He wants you to be a part of it. You ever stop and think about... So we, we talk here about a world that God chose to create, and of course, we're here in 2023, in this world right here. But you realize that when we look at this, it, it's, this, this world isn't just a world that, that lasts from Genesis 1-1 to when Jesus returns. Right? There's going to be a new creation, certainly, but it's still going to be us. It's still our lives. It's still us who experience the challenges and hopefully the growth and this, you know, the spiritual conformity to Christ in this world. And so it continues. Our lives continue on. And so in that sense, it's all the same world that's going to never end. And we're just in a front sliver of it compared to eternity that we have to grow and be with God forever. And so knowing that, I think is behind some of Paul's statements like Romans 8.18. I am convinced that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And he goes on to talk about the whole creation groans and labors in birth pangs, but there will be a birth one day, and when the children of God are liberated and brought free from this body of sin, the whole creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into an eternal, never-ending state. It's an amazing thought, but God has a plan and He will accomplish it. But let's apply ourselves to be a part of the effort. Thank you guys so much. Are there any comments? We have a couple minutes. Yes, Bill. Uh, the more we pray, uh, the more it strengthens our relationship with God, mm -hmm. which in turn will allow us to make these free choices more in mind with God's will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's, it can, can snowball. <laughs> it can just get bigger and better and bigger and better. Uh, several things are like that. You know, like he says, to give, gener give generously, right? So God can give back to you generously. And then you can have more to give to the next, you know, and on and on and on. And the same thing with regard to our will and our spiritual growth in Christ. Excellent point. Anything else? Uh, appreciate it a lot. And uh, next week we have the gospel meeting. So we're not going to meet in here on Monday next week. But we will the following Monday. And then, I might as well say now, the following Monday after that, we won't be here. We'll be in New Hampshire. And then we'll have to finish class the week after that. But if we still have everybody hanging in there, we'll let everybody know that when we come to it. So next time, uh, the week after the gospel meeting, it's going to be on the problem of pain. The problem of evil, pain, and suffering. Well, when God created this world, He knew there was going to be a Nazi Germany that uh, is extremely evil. He knew there was going to be a, a Mao China, a mouse China. Uh, is, you know, why would he do that? Okay. So, uh, Jay, would you mind leading us in a prayer and then we'll be dismissed for the evening? I sure appreciate it. Brother. Our most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we, we humble bow before you at this time, thanking you so very much for everything that you do for us. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come together and, and study your word and, and to to get a better knowledge of what you would have us to know and to get a better knowledge of, of the things that will help us serve you better. And we pray, Father, that if we go through our daily walks of life, that, that we keep in mind that we are born and you did put us into this world for such a time as this. You, you looked down and you saw each one of us as an individual. And you know what you know what our abilities are. You know what our weaknesses are. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to always choose to serve you, no matter how difficult it might be. And we thank you, Father, so much for everything that you do for us, and, and Father, even the things that that may feel, make us feel uncomfortable at times. We pray that you'll give us the strength and the wisdom to to work through those difficult times. And always serve you, just as your son did. 
and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir.